<sighs> right. Hello. Um, Joshua, Sal, and we're going to talk, explore, uh, what are we going to explore? Beingness? Uh, the being of presence. <laughs> the being of presence, the presence of being. Not the presence that we give to one another, <clears throat> the presence that we give to ourselves. The presence that we give to ourselves. Um, okay. Tell me all about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I mean, no, you, I thought you were going to go for your little opening gambit on this one. Well, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can start. Go what, what, is the, what is presence? <laughs> yeah. What is presence? I mean, I know so many people talk about it theoretically. Yeah. But uh, for me, it's just about, you know, acknowledging everything that's coming over me and letting go of it. And just finding something in this moment that gives me certainty, that I'm grateful for, that, you know, just makes me feel part of something bigger. Okay. Um, I honestly don't know what presence is, um, but I can, give it, I, can, I can give it a stab, Go on, right. as the saying goes. Um, when I was a young lad, um, an uncle of mine, I was, I mean, I was so emotionally disturbed. Uh, you know, my, my childhood was so horrendous. And I was very fearful. And whenever I, my uncle and I were together, one of his complaints was that I never looked him in the eyes. And one day, in exasperation, he said to me, he says, what's the matter with you? Why don't you, always, why don't you ever sort of look me straight in the eye when speaking? He says, you know, what do you have to be shy about? What's the matter with you? He says, you've got such presence. He says, if you go into a room, people know you're there. I'd never understood it at the time, but it always stuck with me. Yeah. You know, you've got presence. And, and, and certainly, as far as I'm concerned, throughout the rest of my life, when people meet me, they remember me. And it always surprises me. I've got such a terrible memory. <laughs> and I never remember people's names. And then people come and they, oh, yes. And they met me five years ago. They remember me. They remember my name. I suppose you could say, well, that is a quality of presence. Could that be extended a little bit further and talking about the light that the light. exudes from you, that emits <laughs> from your I was fucked soul. up. I was fucked <clears throat> up. But, but there's still light within everyone, isn't there? There's still aliveness. There's still... Presence. There is an energy, a frequency. That we're I emitting. was, I was so emotionally suppressed. I was so damaged. You wouldn't believe. And yet, allegedly, I had presence. That spark. So, yeah, maybe there is something which is beyond our damaged being. So once we get past that damaged being and we manage to stop distracting ourselves, especially with the phones, which are always there to kind of like, you know, uh, take us take us somewhere down another rabbit hole. If we if we clear all of that and if we can just sit with ourselves, yeah. maybe that means that that light will shine brighter in all of us. And that is the, the quality of presence that we're looking for. Maybe. Um... If I had to put it, make a guess, okay, I don't know. Okay, I, I, I you know, I don't know. Um, I, I, there are many angles to presence. For example, um, if you are congruent within your mind, your emotions, and your body, then you will be able to do things in such a way that other people will be entranced, enthralled, they will, oh, 
if you're an artist, if you're an actor, you know, if you're fully there, if you're fully present with all your three brains, then the person who is looking is going to become entranced by what they're, they're experiencing because they're touched. And so at that moment, you, you'd say, oh, that they've got gravitas or they've got something because they're exuding something which is actually the congruity of their beingness. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, there are people that they, do, they have no impact on us and there are other people who do. Maybe, well, I don't think it's to do with the machine, the vehicle. I don't think it's to do with the, with the personality. I mean, some people are bigger than life in terms of their personality. Um, but they're really, they're just ego. And that can be attractive and repulsive at the same time. However, I think there is another quality which is and i don't know this is true this is true but when a person has got soul expressing itself through that person now that means they have to be in the heart um when soul and um ego are very poorly integrated then what you experience is basically a machine as someone who is very fearful and uh, very conniving and very dishonest the greater the integration the more the person is more thoughtful maybe not <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we're more inclined to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and see the world from that perspective. So more empathic. More empathic, for sure. Um, although that is a very fine line because you can be too empathetic where you are so focused on the other person that you neglect yourself. The rescuer complex. The rescuer <clears throat> complex. So... What we're looking for is, is, is that middle ground, that balanced state where you are neither one nor the other. Yeah. You know, I, can, I, can, I am flexible enough that I can put myself in your shoes and look at the world from your perspective. But I'm not seduced by you because I am as important as you are. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm more important or less important. We're both as important. But I'm able to go into you and then I come back into me and then I say okay well that's what you need that's where you're at but what about me what are my needs and so then we navigate the world in this way where we balance our needs versus other people's needs yeah there are people who focus exclusively on the other person they deny their own needs focusing on the other person and then there is the opposite those people who take no notice of anyone else and only my needs matter so we're looking for balance and we're looking for that middle ground the as as we experience more and more integration in ourselves so our soul ex experiences through us via our hearts and is in the world more and more and that is how we sort of integrate more and more. And perhaps presence is related. You know what? I'm going to ask Charlie. Because <laughs> I, I haven't got a clue. Okay, so the question is to do with presence. Um... Is presence related to soul? No, it's not. Uh, is that correct? 
So presence is an aspect of the ego. So it's an ego thing. Presence is ego. <laughs> well, that's what the uh, <laughs> the cheeky the uh, the cat amongst the canaries. Um, but not so, all ego is bad. Ego is neither good nor bad. There can be bad traits of it. Ego, bad expressions, ego, bad choices. Ego is important. Ego is important um, because ego is totally linked to fear. I think it's going to protect me, but it's not always protecting me, though, is it? Um, ego is a complicated mechanism in that when ego is the manifestation of our DNA, of our genetic traits, which are there for survival's sake, then ego is really, really useful. Yeah. The problem that we have in modern life is that we are heavily indoctrinated. That means we carry a lot of programs in our heads, a lot of which conflict with each other as to how to be in the world, how to behave. We have a lot of rules and regulations inside our heads. And so our ego is fractured. We have different bits of our ego operating at cross purposes to itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so presence, does presence rely on a congruity of ego? Yeah. Um, so presence is just to do with ego. Anything, nothing to do with soul. So soul doesn't even come into the picture. Presence is purely ego, based and that makes sense to me. Calming the ego. No, no, ego based. Um, the harming the ego is. I didn't say that. You said that. Yeah, I'm saying that. I'm asking that question. No, no. Uh, calming. Calming? Calming the oh, ego. Oh, calming. Yeah. Like calm. Yeah, yeah. No, presence. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Uh, presence. It's to do with ego. Um, is it to do with ego? It's to do with ego projection. Has it got anything to do with ego calmness? No. So it's ego projection. So presence is the projection of one's ego, which I suppose means... Um, does it means that you have at least one so there's at least one aspect of one's ego which is very powerful so most of us are fractured in our egos like i said because of rules regulations competing suppressions emotions however if there is an overriding ego instead of having a dozen little satellites You've got a big star with a tiny few planets around, if you like, yeah. Yeah. If you've got if you've got a big sun in the middle, that's an ego. That's they're all egos, but one of them has become boo. Yes. Yeah. So that's what it is. So presence is. A person who's got an aspect of their personality, of their ego, which is so all-pervasive that even though they've got a lot of other little satellites, they appear to have presence. They exist in a way which is not necessarily real. But nevertheless, they give off that sensation. Um, anyway, presence. There you so go. yeah, it's also said that presence and being present leads us to have to be able to trust our intuition more. Okay, so now this is this is a different aspect because there's a difference between presence and being present. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're not the same thing. Right. So, <laughs> being present requires congruity yeah. in the physical body. Uh, now, you can be present with two bodies. 
So you could be present if you're in your physical body and in your mind. It is a weird presence. It's not a full presence. A full presence requires the engagement of one's emotion, which gives, gives, it gives depth to our world. So if I am in my emotions and in my mind, then I have no anchor to the present, to this moment. So I am not present in a, in a physical sense. I am not present here. I am easily lost because my emotions, they're going to be pulling me one way or mm -hmm. another, right? So it's like I'm, I'm in a sea. You know, it could be calm sea, but it could be very rough sea. Yeah? And my mind has no hold on reality. The, the hold on reality is a combination, but it requires the physical body. So to be present, I need to be in my body. You know, ultimately, we're just a brain with a nervous system. And that brain wants to engage beyond itself through the nervous system, through the senses. It's yes, all the five senses, they're all part of the nervous system as much as the nervous system itself. And so we are going out there with our senses. We hear the sounds, we see the, the lights, we see the pictures, we smell. And all of that helps to give us a sense of the world around mm -hmm. us. <clears throat> But we also need to have our nervous system and the fascia engaged so that we can truly connect with the world, ourselves in the world. That video you showed me was of a person who had disconnected from the world. And so she was everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. She was like, she actually called it, I'm in La La Land. And it was wonderful and peaceful but she was disassociated mm -hmm. from within herself. And that's okay, but that isn't what life's about. Life is about being present. And so many people are trying to achieve this La La Land or astral projection. They and think all that's this. where it's that's at. That's where yes. it's, but it's here, isn't it? It's here. It's here. It's a, it's a difficult one. Uh, difficult for me because I am sharing what Charlie has to say and what I come up against is and literally I come up against is all these belief systems to do with La La Land. You know, five dimensional entities, you know, we're all going to grow and move beyond ourselves. Astral travel, I move out of my body. Who moves out of your body? I move out of my body and I go somewhere else. Or I go into a meditation where I don't have to feel anything. Or rather, I don't have to connect with any of my emotions because I've, I've reached a state of peace. So it's like about levels again, isn't it? It's like competition, the hierarchical order, just this old world, you know, yeah. replayed. With then, the spiritual. Well, yes, and then you've got the Pleiadians. Oh, yes. The ones, you know, we've got all this you know, the galactic governments and all these interplanetary things. And, you know, like, yes, some of us, we've got access to this and, you know, we're in the know. Missing the whole point. Life is now, is here. It's about integration, congruity, um, dealing with our problematic experience of bad food, suppressed emotions, uh, internal competing programs. That is, you know, we've got so much on our plate. But this is why, oh, I just go for crystals and I, I go for sounds and flowers and scents. I'm not going to be disdainful of that because some of those can be useful. But we put too much faith on the external, haven't we? We've, we've gone to that because that seems easier, actually. Yeah. 
It's, it is scary going within. It is painful. It is painful. You know, I, like I've shared many times, I had a very, very damaging childhood. And I spent most of my adult life, so sort of, I, I hesitated with the adult, because when do you become an adult? <laughs> but I spent most of my life grappling with my my damaged self and so I went the whole gamut into healing into uh, psychotherapy um, I, I reached the point when I trained very early on in my life to be a spiritual healer and it was always a struggle and as, as I was older it was getting slightly easier because I was doing a lot of Qigong but every time that I truly went and I connected with someone, I couldn't stop crying. It's like there was such a such a deep well of grief, sadness. There was so much hurt in me that I could never truly be what I was meant to be because I had all that pain in the way and I spent years meditating into opening into my into my emotions and allowing the pain to go through my body to experience that to release that tension that deep emotional tension that is within most of us and it took me years, you know, I, I had to find my way the hard way. It took me years to release all of that. And the biggest one was the hardest one to release. And it took me till I was 60 years old. I had started when I was 17 years old. I started by doing yoga and I then moved on to Gurdjieff when I was I was 17. I moved into Gurdjieff at the age of 17. It's unheard of, you know, that sort of younger age to be that focused on looking for answers. And it took me till I was 60 years old to finally take out the spine which had been irritating me the whole of my life. And so how did you find that spine? What was it, uh, you know, to give people that, that uh, fast, fast forward, that, fast forward. And that priority lane? Well, of course, you need to identify it. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's the hardest thing to identify because it's so much who we are. I was always angry with my mother because she'd abandoned me when I was young. And she meant well. But that wasn't my personal experience at the time. And it took till I was 60 when I decided to write my childhood history. And I put myself away for two weeks and I just wrote down everything to do with my childhood that I remembered. And I pieced it all together. It was all there because... I had been so damaged that the way that I survived in the world was by being, this is a joke, by being in the present moment. What I did was that I would not look back and I did not look forward. But mine was an imbalanced present moment because it was a rejection of everything else. I had literally shut down everything. And I just, I just existed in me, totally self-centered. Only I existed in the present moment. So I became very good in my body. You see, I was in my body, no problem. And uh, I was very practical. I became very, you know, I had no problem being me in the present moment, always focusing on the now. But even that can be an imbalance. Life is filled with traps. <laughs> yeah. 
And it's very easy to confuse ourselves as to what is true spirituality. Very, very easy. And I see it, to, I see it today, I see it on Facebook. There are many people who go out there and they, they put up these Facebook pages. And they think that they're very spiritual because they have all this hyperbole about all these spiritual pithy sayings. But it's just another way of not experiencing the pain in us. More acting. It's all subterfuge and delusion. The only truth of being a human being is the experience of what's in us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it could be argued that by being more present that we start to notice the space in between things. I think that's the, that's the gift I've got from meditation and being present. And so in that state of feeling calm, when something does come up, a memory or, or an activation, you're much more present with it. You observe it more because there's less noise going on, that there's actually something there for you to look at. And then in looking at that, you know, there might be a physical sensation of kind of a pain being released. And for me, I've, I've been having those quite recently, um, just, in, just in these little walks that I do just around the church. Um, and then suddenly something will come to me, but because I've, I've got less noise going on, when, I know, when these things come to me, I know that I've got to really pay attention and I'm not distracted by something else. And so that process of sitting with it and loving that, actually it really has helped me to release little fragments of you know, blocks from my childhood. It's been, um, it's been quite insightful. Man, but that's, but that's you've only... Been having, you've been having the... Um... Back flower the back flower remedies. The back flower yeah. They're, they're great for the emotional release. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I know that I was neglecting them for a little fashion, um, but then really good to get back onto that, just seeing how that really helps with, with, the, with the releasing or the remembering. Just, but it's, a, it's, a, it's become an automatic way, and I'm not an expert. You know, my, mind, my mind could go off on things, but because I've trained myself in that way, I just notice the space between things more. I seem to notice more. And it's these little capsules of, of things that are holding me back that just come up, and then it's gone, it dissipates. Well, I mean, this is the issue of mindfulness, um, where we, we observe ourselves. And the value of that is that we begin to recognize that we are fractured human beings. That I may have a desire, a wish, an intent in the morning, but two hours later, I've forgotten it. And I often say this, you know, we're all damaged and the cards are stacked against us, and they are, for all of us. So I wish to remember myself, I want to be observant, I want to notice my thoughts, because it's important, because if I can observe my thoughts, I will begin to realise that I am not my thoughts, that there are automatic repetitions, they're like tape recorders, mindless tape recorders, that, that just repeats things of my intent. I may have an intent inside of me and then the words take over and then they repeat it like, and now it's like the words is the person. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that happens to all of us. And invariably what's going on there is I am avoiding connecting with emotions which have been unprocessed. And that's true for all of us. Mindfulness is a springboard and it's really important because it helps to give us that awareness that we are machine-like, that we are at the mercy of thoughts, that we are at the mercy of emotions, that we are damaged human beings. It's important to recognize that, to accept that in ourselves. However, mindfulness can never achieve what it promises. The promise of mindfulness is that I am present all the time, observing, and that's never going to happen for any of us, okay, for any of us, because we're all damaged. We're damaged from the word go. Um, I, I, in, the, in that little video you showed me, I'll put a link on that, it was really great the way she sort of showed the two hemispheres of the brain, between the left and the right, yeah? 
how they were just sort of a little small connection, but really they're two separate parts. And for me, it highlighted the truth that I know of myself that my left and right don't talk to each other. You know, like my my wordiness, my abstract is it, terrible. Um, I, I cannot connect the two. I'm, I'm an emotional being. Uh, like I said, my emotional side is not very healthy either. So I'm totally fucked up <laughs> between one side and another. And yet, it is possible to go beyond that. Uh, there, there is grace. There is grace for us. And the grace is in our hearts. If we can manage to get to our hearts, whew, we will still lose our, our sense of perspective. We will still um, not always follow our intent. Oh, I was going to do this. Oh, I've forgotten. Because we are damaged. But if we manage to get to our hearts, then none of that matters. It's okay. It's okay to be small in that way because what matters is that connection with the heart. And part of the reason why we will never get there is because the damage is not just emotional, it's food. You know, like I damage myself through a lot of my life by eating the wrong foods and I created brain damage. Um, brain damage through... Um, through internal inflammation as a result of lectins and oxalic acid. Um, I've damaged my brain, I've damaged other parts of my system. Some of them will heal, some of them will not. We come into a world which is damaged and damaging. And we cannot avoid that. Somehow we have to survive through everything the world throws at us to get to the other end. And the, the other end, we, be, we come into the world with our hearts and we want to get to the other end, which is back in our hearts. The journey is the difficult bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, we started with heart and we end up with heart and uh, that's what we're after everything else is fantasy you see that reminds me i, I, I was at uh I was in the pub once with some friends and i upset this uh my friend's friends who i didn't meet before we're having a discussion about you know feeling life and i was just talking about the first thing that's created in the body essentially is the heart this created such anger in to, to the uh, people we're with. Actually, I'm going to disagree. The first thing that's created in the body is the fascia. Everything grows within the fascia. The first organ to be created is the heart. Um, <laughs> pedant. Um, yeah, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> no, first... no, you're good. You're and, good. and that it seemed to really upset to the people that I was with this thought the the heart is where it's at and it's about the brain obviously it's only about the brain and we just neglect this so much so much that I give them that scientific information and it destroys everything in their head and they're not willing to go there and we just end up in a moment of anger and that's another very important thing to to be aware of that we we, we begin in our hearts and in our bodies and in our imagination. If, if you look at children when they're young, they're in their bodies, they're in their hearts, they're in their imagination. They're creatures of joy. Yeah. Yeah. And then gradually, the world takes us and we lose all of that. And... As, as we become emotionally suppressed because of the hurts of the world, as we become disassociated because of the programs that tell us how we have to be, how to behave, we gradually begin to remove ourselves from our body. 
our awareness of our body begins to disappear and we gradually move to the head. So most people, if you say, well, where are you at? Where is your center? Your center is not there, but somewhere in there. I mean, not there as in the third eye, right? Not, not, <laughs> not in their imagination, but somewhere in their brain. Their center is in their minds. And they've switched off from their bodies. And in the process, they also switch off from their emotions to a greater or lesser extent. And what you're saying is that when you mention the heart, they react because they know that what you say is true. And but it's too painful to go there. Yeah, and they, they, they've forgotten how to access that. Yeah. Yeah. And yet that's, a, that's quite a big theme, isn't it? Um, that I see when people are trying to explore their consciousness and or their body um, is that there's a fear of looking at that, a fear of realising how magnificent they are, a fear of an aspect of their ego is going to be destroyed, so it's protecting them. What, what, where's that fear coming from, and how is that so powerful? Well, uh, like I said earlier on, we are genetically designed to survive in this world via fear. So fear is an important aspect of the ego. And so ego has got various levels, but the, the basic ego is the ego, the survival of the organism. And every organism has that to a greater or lesser extent. They know how to be in the world. They know what to do, how to react so that they can survive. In fact, I'll just digress and says they know what to eat and what not to eat. They don't need to be told you need to have five portions of this a day because their bodies know what they need. And whether you're a herbivore or a carnivore, you know what to go for. You know what you need to eat. You don't need to be told. It's, you know, it's, it's an automatic impulse within us. But human beings have lost that. We, we no longer know what's good for us because we're poisoning ourselves with all manner of stuff. And we poison our, poison our children from the word go. We go to our children and say, oh, you know, you've got to have your your vegetables. How's it going that song? Uh, you've got to eat all your veg if you want to have any pudding. <laughs> um, so we, 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 we're lost. As human beings, we're lost. We, we've lost all sense of who we truly are. Lost at sea, apparently. We're lost at sea and we've, we've thrown away the, uh, the anchor, which is our bodies. Um, so where were we going with this? <laughs> so we got our bodies, the mind and the centre of self. So the centre of self needs to come down to the heart. But to get to the heart, we have to rediscover the body. And to rediscover the body, we have to get in touch with pain. Physical pain, so that's it. Pain. That's it, isn't it? You know, the protections. Like, sorry, I'm not interested. Oh, the pain business. No, we'll just leave that. I'm just going to go go shopping and eat cake. It's so much easier, nice, isn't it, yeah. than, than facing it? <laughs> if only it were that simple. I when I used to do needle acupuncture, and there were two types of people. There were those in whom I would stick a needle. And the pain would be unbearable. And the next time they came back, even before I put the needle in, the pain would be unbearable. Because what they were now doing is, their mind had now had that short moment of experience and re reacted to it. So, oh, they go off into their brain. Now, the next time... As I approach with the needle, their brain is now remembering how they can, how they don't remember the pain. They remember how they can, they had run away from the pain. And so they're now regurgitating their remembrance of, I ran away from that pain because that's really painful. Yeah. So now, <laughs> no, 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 no. So now there's all drama, but the drama is all in the head. 
It's not in that. So now we've got the opposite. We've got the people who had stick the, n the needle in, but because they're so switched off from their bodies, they're not even registering it. So they don't mind. They're quite happy for you to do that, you know, because they're, they're just not there in their bodies. So those are the two extremes. Yeah. And there is a third option, which is where we experience the pain for the first time every time. So if you stick the needle in, if you breathe out into the pain, then you experience the pain, but as you're breathing out, it's not, it sort of bypasses, it bypasses the mind in some weird way. Yeah. And so you experience it without the drama. And so every time is the first time. And it's the same time when we get hurt. Every time we get hurt, if we stop, stop whatever we're doing and focus on that pain, experience that pain, let it wash through us, then it's always the first time we experience that pain. We don't run away from the pain. Um, so that's physical pain, but it's the same to do with emotions. Yes. Emotional pain is the same thing. So what we do is we, we have a, a disagreement with someone for whatever reason. And then we go away. The drama is unresolved. But now we begin to replay what I would have said this or I would have said that or I would have said the other thing. But what we've now done is, what we're doing is, we are, we are avoiding the experience of the emotion we were, we were experiencing temporarily when we were having that argument, that discussion, that differences of opinion, whatever it was, which has less, left us unsettled and is now replaying, and it may replay for hours. And what we need to do is, every time, and this is where mindfulness comes in, the self-observation, where we observe the thoughts and we see that, okay, well, these thoughts, they're connected to my emotions. So what is the emotion behind this regurgitating of thoughts? Maybe I'm experiencing shame. You know, I'm, maybe I'm angry, but behind the anger, there could be fear. Um, maybe I, I, I needed something. I, I need to belong with this person. I, I, need, I need their friendship. And so the, the, I, I said shame, but there may be a combination of different emotions. So I need to keep making the effort, go down. What am I experiencing? What is my emotion right now? Not the words. What's the emotion? See the other person. Relieve the experience of that event. What am I experiencing? And just keep going there. Keep going there. Keep going there. And so we, we, we develop the stamina to experience unpleasant confrontational emotions. And we're all subject to this. And it happens automatically. And this is how we literally fall asleep in the world. And so we, we keep bringing up, and all the time what we're doing is we're bringing ourselves back into our body, into our body, into our body. Release the emotion, release, whatever it is, release that emotion. You know, maybe there's anger, maybe there's justified anger, maybe I suppress an anger, maybe... Maybe the other person in, infringed on my space in some way or other. But I am too nice. Maybe I've got a, a mental program that says, oh, nice people don't behave like that. Or maybe, yes, I understand because he's in so much pain and what I feel doesn't matter. You know, so maybe it's all about him, nothing about me. So... We need, we need to separate all of that. We need to experience the emotion. We need to really go into the intensity of letting it. And the more we do it, the easier it becomes to, to experience stuff which is stashed deeper. So not just what's on the surface, but what's really deep down inside. When I was um, 
early 30s, um, I, I was into the, the, the healing world and there were this couple, they were doing, and, and I went to them because I was disturbed and I asked for healing. And as they were doing their healing on me, I became really curious because there was like a little pain in there. And in my imagination, I could see it. It was like a ball. I was like, no. And then it just began to go up. <laughs> and as it went up, by the time it reached my mouth, I screamed my head off. You know, I really went, ooh. And it was like, ah! it was a cry of pain. And I didn't understand it. I did not know what it was. And I apologized, as one does. And I said, look, you know. And sometime after that, because I was getting really involved into a psychotherapy, so I went to a, I was in a group and we, we hadn't actually started. So everybody was milling around. Everybody was sitting around just waiting. Someone else was going to come. And I began to go into a little bit of a daydream. I, I was sitting there, not really listening to anybody. Just, And then I became aware of this little thing again. And this ball began to go up again. And it went up through my mind and I went... And everybody looked at me and I could see the white jackets flapping in my direction. <laughs> <laughs> um, the lunatic. And I apologised again. And, and I had no idea and I had no control over it. It was a pain which had been in me since day young. And what I did after that is I cultivated going on uh, merry-go-round rides on the um, the big deeper things like yeah. that you know when you go to uh, to this kiddies uh, fairgrounds fairgrounds yeah. yeah and i would just love to go into these things and i'd be at the top and as we were going down i'd go Rah! oh that was so liberating <laughs> and the same going tobogganing i love going tobogganing because as I went down, I could just scream. <laughs> it's a popular one in Bali uh, to go to the edge of a cliff and then to scream and let it all out. But there's another one, uh, and it was a mistake I made. I was, I was instructed to scream. It's just, no, no, you're doing it all wrong. It's like, scream inside. So it was actually letting it all out, but not anything, you know, yeah. all, from the audio. Yeah. Um, and that was quite an amazing experience as well, being at the edge of the, at the edge of the coast on this on, on this you know cliff overlooking the sea, and to be screaming, letting everything out, but not to make any sound. Okay, that's a new one on me. Um, <laughs> for you know, horses for courses. For me, <clears throat> I love screaming. And now, screaming isn't the answer. But it is part of the release. It's a good release. Yeah. You know, I mean, the answer is deeper than that. But it's for those of us who have been severely traumatized and we're moving forward, being able to scream our head off, you know, like with the whole of our bodies. Not, it's not, you know, I said my head off, but yeah, I want the head off. Scream with the head off. I, I want to scream with the whole of my body. Yeah. It's so, so wonderful for the, for the system just to let go of that tension. And that's what we do. We have to, you know, you mentioned what do we do? How do we help ourselves? Well, thank you for the reminder. Screaming is important. Find a place where you can really scream, really let it rip. The reason why we don't scream is because our programming, our mental head, is telling us that's not what you do. You don't behave like that. You'll be society. charged. You'll be a crazy. You're, you're not in Absolutely. control of your emotions. What a oh, nice one! <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> down emotion. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, 
finding a place, an avenue, where we can actually scream our head off. Oh, wonderful. It just, it, it's like a choo-choo train, you know, when the pressure builds up, boom, boom. <laughs> let off some steam. <laughs> However, the real letting of steam is when we sit down and we focus into our, essentially it's our lower abdomen, and we kinesthetically, you know, energy is a funny word. I like the word kinesthetic because if you do this, you'll be able to sense like a little pressure between your hands. And that pressure is a kinesthetic sensation. But you can use that in your imagination. You can just imagine that and it becomes real, that sensation around the lower abdomen. And just be there. Not notice the physical sensations inside the abdomen. And gradually, as you focus that kinesthetic sensation, you'll start to get a taste for emotions. And whatever needs to come out will, little by little. And it can take a long time to get to the core, to the biggies, but that's okay. Every, every, every little effort is good, is good effort. And that's how I did it. Um, but like I say, till I got to the biggie, and the biggie, when I was 60, was to do with my mother. I had never forgiven her for having left me. Yeah. And that not forgiving meant that I was a victim. I had seen myself as a victim to my mother. A victim to my anger. My justified anger. You know, because I was the victim. Yeah. And it wasn't until I put myself in her shoes, why did she actually leave me? You know, when I wrote, when I spent those two weeks writing my whole life, I saw my mother in context. I saw how she was a damaged being as much as I was. She had lost her mother when she was young. And she repeated the same thing that happened to her with me. That's what we do. So she had been carrying through the whole of her life the grief of the loss of her mother. And right up to her death, that grief was there with her. Mm. And uh, once I had put myself in her shoes and looked at her, the world from her perspective, I understood why she had put me in an orphanage at the age of three. And that allowed me to let go of my anger. And once I let go of my anger, my heart fully opened up. So I had been, <laughs> I had been angling, working towards opening my heart for over 40 years. And it took that long for me to, to finally let go of the big piece, the big part of the jigsaw puzzle, which was my sense of anger and victimhood, an entitlement to being angry in relation to my mother. Mm -hmm. And once I forgave my mother, Charlie, <laughs> Charlie came. So. so, you know, we, we, we all have to do it differently. And not everyone needs to do it to the same level that I have. We just need to do it enough that we can open our hearts. Enough that we can have enough of a connection that our soul and body integration is sufficient that we can experience love. 
How do people know that they're opening their hearts? Because, you know, again, we can kid ourselves, can't we? So what, what's, what's the, what are the signs? Oh, I don't know. What do I know? From um, your experience. Um, okay. M my heart is open when I look at myself and I forgive <laughs> what a shitty person I think I am. Because that's my mind telling me I'm not good enough for this, mm. that or the other. But when I am in my heart, first, you know, first we all know we're in our heart because we are in our hearts. It is a physical sensation as well as a feeling sensation. And so when I'm in my heart and I look at myself, I, I see myself with compassion because I am damaged. I will always be damaged. To the end of my days, I will be damaged. I've been damaged by my emotional childhood. I've been damaged by my physical food eating over the years. Um, I've been damaged by all my experimentation on my body over the years in trying to learn about healing in so many different facets. You know, it's been a long road of learning for me. And I have damaged my... Some of those things are being healed right now by Charlie, but some of those things will never be healed. And that's who I am. I am not always present. You know, I am the first one to acknowledge. I am no mystical guru. <laughs> you know, I'm not someone to be put on a pedestal. I'm like everyone else. I am damaged, um, I, I have moments of forgetfulness, um, I have moments when my head's going ten to the dozen, you know, I'm like everyone else. The difference for me is that when I'm in my heart, I'm in my heart. And, and you know how to get there? Funnily enough, is. It's not of knowing how to get there because we're either there or we're not. <laughs> but if you're not, then you don't know how to get there. It's a chicken and egg. <laughs> okay. But the only way to get there is by working our way through our pain, our emotional pain, the pain that arises out of mental conflicting. You know, we, we all have so many conflicting belief systems. And we need to be able to, to be flexible in our minds so that we don't get attached to the belief system. Yeah. A belief system is a good way. Belief systems are a way of um, defining the world around us. They keep us safe so we're not too fearful. Um, but clearly, the Chester belief system, they're a poor imitation of, of reality. So we need to keep an open mind. You know, I've gone through a lot of belief systems over my lifetime and I only hang on to them for as long as they were useful. Mm -hmm. As soon as they were no longer useful, as soon as they, I could see that they did not reflect reality, I let them go. Moved on. Strong opinions lightly held. There you go. Yeah. Yes, you got to, if you believe something, you got to believe it. Otherwise, what's the point of having a belief, yeah. right? <laughs> you either believe it or you don't believe it. So this is, this is a weird one because when I believe something, I need to believe it. And yet there has to be that flexibility within me that I question my belief for the moment that it no longer verifies reality. Yeah. And as soon as it does that, I have to let it go and go searching for another belief. And yet so many people hold on to those beliefs. They form their identity. They form their, their world viewpoint and the basis of everything. We all do that, coming back to, to ego um, and the DNA and the genetic fear. We need to belong to the group. That is how we, we talked about this before. This is how we feel safe. And so our belief systems are all structured around this ego thing of we need to belong. Yeah. And this makes it really hard. 
And, you know, in a way, I think my saving grace is that perhaps the reason why I am who I am today, fucked up, but perhaps the reason why I am who I am today is because I was thrown out from the group. I was taken away from my mother. I was taken away from a number of groups as I was growing up. Um, because I was so damaged, most people didn't want to know me. So I was always on my own. I was always a loner. I was always lonely. And I learned to rely on myself rather than on the group for survival. And I, I say that was my saving grace because it meant that however enticing belonging to a group might have been, my fear of losing myself in that group was always greater than my need to be in the group. So, you know, we all need to be in a group. I, you know, I needed it as much as anyone else. But my fear of losing myself within the group mentality was greater. And that meant that I was always much more critical of other people's beliefs, the, you know, society. Uh, to, not completely, because uh, there were things I never questioned till later on. But nevertheless, I think that was my saving grace, my my ability to question my own belief systems um, because I didn't need to hang on to them to belong to the group, yeah. which a lot of people do. And it's really hard to let go of a belief system when it is shared by the group and you want to be in the group and you daren't, because as soon as you stop believing that, the group are going to turn on you. Yeah. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> Once you become an anti this, anti that, anti the other, woof, you're out. Yeah, and I'm not going to go into details as to what an anti means, but there are many anti antis in this present society. And once you once you have that label, you start questioning, you're out. Mm. Yeah, ain't that the truth? So, ain't that the truth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we've we've actually we've gone a long way. Um, the whole purpose of this particular video was meant to do with uh, being present in the moment, and uh, being present in the moment is really really important. And at the same time, we need to be kind enough to ourselves to recognize that we will never be fully present in the moment all the time. We're too damaged. It's not possible. That doesn't mean to say we shouldn't try, because it really is very, very important to realize that we are not the thoughts in our heads, that we do need to be in our bodies, that we, knew, we do need to recognize our emotions and uh, express them, appropriately at the right time and that the whole purpose of being a human being is to come into our hearts indeed beautiful i think on that note we'll probably let this one go yes yeah?